just say a few general words because this is really there was a there was a seminar last week, but this is the first one that's on the 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 abiding theme of this of this uh, trimester, and it's a theme that goes right to the heart and soul of cognitive sciences. What we're not what unites all of the disciplines that that contribute to cognitive sciences, uh, psychology, com computer science, informatic. Um, linguistics, neuroscience, philosophy, biology, what unites all of those is the fact that cognition, which is what it is that human beings do, is done by many different species and by many different devices. You may not be generous with the word cognition when, when I'm talking about a device. You might say that, well, it's, it's cognitively relevant, but is it cognizing? That's, a, that's one of the questions in this field. Uh, when is a device actually cognizing rather than just doing information processing or causality? Um, th the answers to that are not definitive yet. But, but another thing that splits the field is when you're, you're studying cognition or cognitive processes, because you're trying to create uh, or, or integrate devices that do things that are useful to people, or you're interested in understanding how it is that people and other organisms do those things. That's the difference between what used to be called artificial <coughs> and what's now called cognitive modeling. Our speaker's uh, work will touch on both of these. And the problem that's at the heart of them really at the heart of it all is how do you connect symbols, which are what it is that, that uh, for example, computers process bits. Uh, how do you connect symbols, either low order ones like zeros and ones or high order ones like, like a, a programming languages or natural languages? How do you co connect the symbols in those codes, and they are codes, to the things in the world that those symbols can be interpreted as being about. That's the symbol grounding problem. And there are many, many different angles to it. Uh, and the one that Cynthia takes is more or less centered on the question of language. Now I'll, I'll recompose a little bit of what you've already read. How do you in, extract meaningful representations of human language by, map, by mapping them onto a noisy, unpredictable physical world, which is what rob robots are operating in. Cynthia will be presenting probabilistic, grammar-based natural processing uh, techniques and learning, integrating them into a formal language that a robot can understand and producing a system that non-specialists, and this is relevant for people who work in, in uh, interactions, non-specialists can instruct, control, and interact with intuitively and naturally. <laughs> Cynthia is in uh, the University of Maryland, Baltimore Ca uh, County. Uh, she's in the computer science and electrical engineering department, and she founded the Interactive Robotics and Language Lab. And I've already talked too much. With this, I hand it over to Cynthia. Thank you very much for that very, <laughs> very thorough introduction. He didn't talk too much. All right, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Oh, yes, I had forgotten. I don't believe I can see the chat box when I'm in the mode of presenting slides. So what should we do as a solution? I could, I, I uh, I think I can see it while you're presenting. Just let me check if I can still see it. Um, chat. But I, I do yeah. also encourage people to just blurt out. Um, okay, that's a, if you have a question and it hasn't been noticed, you can just say, uh, I have a question and Cynthia will either accept it or say, wait, wait a little bit. And I'll mm -hmm. mention it if I see it on the chat, I have the chat up for myself. Go ahead, Cynthia. All right, so thank you very much indeed for having me. Um, today I'm going to talk about the language grounding problem, which is 
uh, for me, very much a question of how can robots and computers in general perform useful groundings. So there's been a lot of work in this space recently for a number of related areas. And in this talk, I just want to call out a couple of insights for how computers can handle that problem and talk a bit about what's next. So the core problem for robotics is that for robots to be particularly useful for humans, uh, they need to be able to engage in interactions, right? So right now we have robots that are not particularly interactive, they're brittle. Uh, I like to say that flexible, adaptable robots exist in a one-to-one -one relationship with robotics grad students. And I like to say that because it's true. Um, robots are brittle. Language is an ideal mechanism for those interactions because um, humans are good at it. It's comparatively concise. I'm not sure what just happened. I beg your pardon. It's comparatively concise and you know, it's already something that does a good job of describing the world in a meaningful way, but it's also a very difficult problem computationally. So I'm hoping to talk about a few different learning approaches that I've tried, uh, the importance of interacting with speech, and some of my recent work on how can you even make sure that you're getting enough and the right kind of data. So one of the key insights here is that collaborative interactions require some form of communication. Uh, if you don't have some form of communication between agents, then you have agents that are functionally working around each other, but not collaborating. And in particular, when we're talking about robotics, we want people to be able to teach and customize and direct their teammates with respect to their environments. So we refer to this sort of language in the physical world as grounded language in which percepts and actions are grounded against the linguistic inputs that you're getting from people. Okay. And the reason that language is such a good intermediary for this is that interactive machine learning can learn language from interactions while what to do in those interactions is learned from language. So this process can be a bit of a loop. And robots give the physical context that you need for languages. So this, this is sort of key to one of the main points that I'm hoping to reiterate during this talk is that you do need language uh, you do need robots to provide any kind of physical context. Um, as soon as robots, as soon as computers extend into the world where they can see things and interact with things and sense things, then it moves into the realm of robotics. And that's important because if you look at something like this, you know, I already gave it away, but if you're trying to understand somebody is saying something and you're trying to understand what they want you to do, what action this should be grounded out in, um, you probably would have a guess, probabilistically. Is it more likely that somebody says push, push up or shut up to a robot? But now you have a much better idea of what's likely to be going on, what's going on in this, in this query, in this space. Grounded language learning is an area that's really hot in a number of fields right now, which I mean, obviously I'm very excited about. Um, but one of the things that is worth noting, and I think, you know, I'm, I, potentially I'm going to get in trouble already with this slide, um, is that although we agree that language has meaning in some real context, we don't as a set of fields agree on what context means. So grounded language, something exists and it's referred to by language. But that context for language people means the words around the words, right? The, the linguistic context. For vision, 
language refers to images. It refers to what you can retrieve informationally from images or how you can label them. For cognitive systems, I am told that uh, context means past experience plus current knowledge. And in robotics, context means the real physical world in which language occurs. So the actual like physical apple that a robot is trying to pick up. And robotics is semi unique in this sense, because there are two language, there are two reference problems being solved. You have language, which is a mechanism that mediates meaning. And you have percepts, perceptual inputs that mediate the real world. And you have to understand how both of those things, um, you have to decode, essentially, both of those ideas. And there is, as I said, there's a whole lot of work in this area. Um, I'm really, I, I, can't, I can't present an overview of language grounding and robotics in a single hour, but I'm hoping that I'll be able to give an overview of some of the key ways in which it can be treated. And one of the key things that ties the different pieces of work I'm going to go over together is the idea of treating grounding as a dual problem learning to understand how percepts describe the physical world and how language describes the meaning of what is supposed to be happening in the physical world or what exists in the physical world. Could I ask you not... a question? Yes, Please. of course. Okay. Uh, I understand language and mm -hmm. I understand what words are, but I have more trouble understanding what you mean by percepts. Mm -hmm. So percepts is literally any input from a, a perceptual device from a sensor. So if a camera or your eyes see some sees something, um, then the raw percepts are the red, green and blue wavelengths coming in in some pattern. If you hear somebody speaking, the percepts are the sound waves hitting your ears. So what you mean by percepts so, is what you mean by percepts is sensory inputs. Yeah, percepts is the is robotics for sensory input for it's, perceptual input. It's important because we're in, the, is, we're in the cognitive sciences, and there are other disciplines for whom percept means something different. But okay, by percept you mean henceforth sensory input. Yes, Very perceptual good. inputs. Thanks, Cynthia. Loaded implications of, but yes. All right. So, and thank you for that because the rest of the talk won't make much sense without it. So, so one of the key things, one of the key insights I claim, one of the key ways to handle the question of grounding language into the physical world is treat language, well, it is the case that language and the physical world have some shared embedding. They are two different projections into reality of a thing that has real physical meaning, right? So this is an elaboration of what I was just saying. Um, my slides are misbehaving and I do apologize. Uh, in that percepts are what you can perceive, but they are not the world itself, right? So if you're dealing with a coffee mug and you're looking at it, you're perceiving depth and color, but you are not actually perceiving the coffee mug in its raw state, sort of, this is akin to the concept of a platonic object. Whereas language, obviously you're not seeing the thing in its raw state. When I say the mug, you're performing some interpretation, but the insight that both of those refer to a single thing, that that's what grounding is, uh, means that physically grounded language and percepts have some shared embedding in what we would call a non-observable latent space, in a space where, um, although we cannot see it, we, have, we cannot have direct insight into it, these things connect. And if you treat it that way, 
then you can try to learn a single joint model of that shared multimodal embedding. So instead of trying to learn what words mean and separately how vision, visual percepts translate into mugs, you can treat it as a shared problem in which the two have to coexist, have to align. So shared space embeddings and projections are, I think, we, we often have this sort of iceberg diagram. You know, we see this bit at the top, we can't see this huge thing at the bottom. But I think the parable of the elephant and the wise men is more accurate, in which a group of blind men are asked to go investigate an element or an elephant and come back and tell a king traditionally uh, what it is. So they all go do their best to perceive it with their limited perceptual capabilities. All perceptual capabilities are limited. And one of them comes back and says an elephant is like a tree. Um, it's big and round and firmly rooted to the ground. And another comes back and says an elephant is like a rope. Uh, it's long and thin and flexible. And a third comes back and says an elephant is like a wall. And none of these is incorrect. Each of these is a partial projection into the perceptual space of the actual grounded thing, of the actual object. And one way to tackle that is to treat it as explicitly that kind of shared embedding. So manifold alignment is the process of trying to approximate some reality in which heterogeneous domains have some non-observable overlap. So if you have some reality and you've got speech on one side, somebody is talking about a mug and an observed world, somebody is, you know, you've got a set of percepts coming in, then in here somewhere is the thing that is the, is, is required to coexist, required to be the same because they refer to the same object. And given that you can approximate, given enough data, and this is where it goes into a machine learning direction, given enough examples of that, you can approximate the shape of this reality with some function or functions that allows you to take a new object, put it into that function and understand what other modality it refers to. So more explicitly, We've got something like um, a positive point, which we're perceiving, and it's a robot perceiving it, right? So it, literally it's seeing things like this, an image and some sensed depth. And we also have language that refers to that thing and language does not, that does not refer to that thing. And we're trying to learn model, we're trying to learn a shared function, uh, function vision to language, FV, and function language to vision, FL that correspond to one another and produce uh, things in the same approximation of the space. So to be more explicit, which I think is more helpful, the idea is that you're forcing similar concepts from different domains together in some proposed space while similarly forcing dissimilar concepts apart. And the proposed space that I'm talking about here, this manifold, is mathematically described, right? It's a function into which you can put new things or old things and get some place in space. It's not necessarily in and of itself human understandable. So broadly speaking, the idea here is that you have um, input percepts coming from a robot and some positive thing that describes those input percepts. So someone described this as a red tomato on a plate. And somebody described something else in your data set as a white coffee cup. That's a negative example. It's an example of something that shouldn't be close to the thing that we, this anchor point, the thing that we are talking about. And it's key to note here that the anchor point is in perceptual space. The positive and negative examples are in linguistic space. So you're trying to find a mathematical function that forces the positive to be close to the anchor and the negatives to be far from the anchor. And if you treat that as just a geometric 
you know, manifold alignment problem, uh, you can visualize the outputs by saying, okay, give me an n-dimensional visualization, in this case, two-dimensional visualization of where the data goes in the mapping that you've learned. So, um, and then you can, you can use that to say, okay, here is a new thing. Where is it output in the map? And what, what can you do with it? Is that the correct interpretation of a human's intention? So we performed this trial, we performed this task over a fairly large data set, something like 1500 people describing 500 objects or so. And 10 randomly selected classes are visualized here. Uh, if I do more than that, it becomes qu quite difficult to see what's going on. But these circles here show individual classes. So the pink classes are a combination of tomato and it looks like they are almost exclusively water bottle. The brown classes here are uh, food bags. And you can see that on the language side and on the vision side, these things are fact very close together. So these are randomly selected staplers, cell phones, and randomly selected descriptions of them. And they do in fact form a picture that shows that these things are in the same space in the manifold. And beyond that, because, because my field is robotics, my question is not only, okay, does that seem like a good mapping, but also, uh, does it work? And for me, does it work is pretty purely a question of, if you tell the robot to do a thing, does it do the right thing? And if it does the right thing, then the robot, for my purposes, understands the language. So this is an example of a sequence of, of things in which a robot is asked to solve, uh, is asked to pick up an object or perform an action or something. In this case, it's picking up these objects and how well it performs using, this is sort of traditional deep learning for grounding is this dotted red line. And the, our new proposed manifold alignment methods are these blue and orange lines. And you know, perfect behavior, the robot picks up everything you ask it to pick up is in the bottom right. So we're outperforming current work on getting a robot to understand language well enough to perform a task. So this is intended as a way of both demonstrating that you can get a robot to understand for some definition of understanding uh, what language means simply by treating it as a shared embedding, simply by saying, okay, these things must be in some, some sense, some space that we can't see, must be close. They must, they must have some joint meaning. Uh, without necessarily diving into what the language or the vision even are. Sorry. So, um, uh, I do have a question that, uh, uh, about please. the mapping process between language and vision. Would you like to explain, please, more uh, about the details behind the mapping process? Are there any semantic theories or just labeling association? This is purely association driven. Um, for what I've described so far, uh, you take existing language that you can featureize by saying these are the words in it, these are the sentence structures in it, these are the parts of speech that we are seeing. So syntactic deconstruction, but not semantic deconstruction and saying these things co-occur with this object that you can see um, with this visual thing that the robot is perceiving, feeling, seeing, sensing depth on and so on. Co-occurring, it means we are in distributional semantic, I guess. Yes, and the reason I actually paused the slideshow is I wanted to ask if anybody wanted to pick a fight with me about defining understanding language as doing the right thing with it. Um, or rather whether I've, I've picked a fight with anybody by giving that definition. Um, because of okay, course it's you. not the meaning of understanding 
that we as humans use by default. But it is very much the case that it's a meaning of understanding that's hard to squabble with in terms of sort of a Chinese room problem, right? Um, I am doing things based on your input that are the right things. You have no mechanism for knowing whether I understand them semantically or distributionally or what, and you have no idea, I have no idea about that for you. You have no idea about that for you. So, all right. Thank you. Can I add another question uh, along those lines to your challenge? Um, <clears throat> I, I can't, can't quarrel with the idea that it's got something to do, to do with doing the right thing. That's, there's no, I think anybody who says that their notion of the understanding is not in some way related to that is talking about something else. But what do you mean in your task by doing the right thing? Is it a local thing that when I give you this particular object, you give it this particular name? Or is it, or is, or is understanding in that case, something that goes, that, that generalizes basically? I'm asking the question about generalization. I am, I'm deliberately saying does the right thing because given some set of perceptual traces and some set of inputs, there is nothing specific to any particular domain about it. Um, it might be picking up the right object or it might be performing the right action. It might be, and we, we have demonstrated a fair amount of generalization using formal grammars, learned formal grammars to describe and featureize the linguistic input. But ultimately, the idea of generalization strongly assumes some observed categorization that we, I actually try not to assume. So whether it generalizes to things it's never seen before, no, it doesn't, it shouldn't. Uh, broadly speaking, if I ask you to pick up the, the you know, the TIVIC, um, the correct response is, I don't know what you mean. But in terms of generalizing purely to things that you've never seen or heard before, um, but are given examples of, that's sort of coming up later in the talk. Okay. I'm not sure that addressed your question. Yes, it did. Because I mean, in, in classical machine learning, you always have the, the learning sample and then you have the test sample. And I wanted to make sure that it wasn't, that you weren't basing it all on the, on, on the local capacities in the learning sample. If you can generalize to stuff you haven't seen before, you've generalized. You, ca you can and you can't, right? Machine learning is very bound by representation of what it has been trained on. So if you are, if you are, um, I'm sorry, I was just distracted by somebody trying to come in. Um, if you are, if you provide a completely new concept with a completely new set of percepts, then machine learning, including this tends to fall down. The question, for, and also including us, I think, uh, the question for me is whether having learned an, a, a number of things along these lines, is it possible to learn other things very quickly, learn novel things very quickly based on what you already know? And, you know, in a sense, I'm just redefining, um, redefining generalization to suit my own purposes. But let me go on a little about novel concepts, and then we'll come back to it if I haven't described it successfully, okay? okay. Thanks very much. Of course. So another way to consider language grounding, and this is, this is, this is the slide where I usually pick a fight with natural language people, um, is to say that a grounding, language grounding bottoms out in being a classification problem. And of course that's not true, or at least that's a description of only certain classification and grounding problems or attempts. But the truth is that when somebody says, at least to a robot, but typically to a computer, something like, this is a lemon, uh, go to the end of the hall and turn left, 
Uh, these blue blocks are together. The red one is also rectangular. The reason that you do that is that your goal eventually is to be able to, to cope with instructions like this. Get a lemon from the basket or tell me which way he went or help me stack the ones that look like long pillars. You don't usually provide information for the sake of it. And classification is a pretty good pragmatic interpretation of a lot of grounded language. So if you treat that as a purely classification problem, then you can subdivide it into sort of a training problem where you've got natural language utterances with observed world context. You've got some kind of interaction that defines the overlap. So when you say, hand me the orange ball and point to something, the orange ball becomes the activity or the world trace that combines them. So your goal then is to learn classifiers that go from percepts to class memberships and a parser that goes from natural language to some formal description. So something like if you say hand me the orange ball, there exists something that is orange in color and spheroid in shape. And I haven't included do something with it here. And those things in turn should subdivide viewed reality into categories so that you can ask whether those categories apply. So this is sort of the early grounded language approaches, but the biggest challenge there and where my work started in this, in this scene is what if those formal concepts don't exist? So, okay, if you have a formal language that describes the world, you can learn how language refers to it, that's, that's good. But if you have never previously considered things like orange or spheroid, whether these are not, if these are not concepts that you're familiar with, what do you do? Um, ideally, you don't just run completely aground as soon as you encounter something that wasn't in your training data. And again, it, this comes back to the idea of jointly modeling correspondences. So physically grounded systems see novel physical things and you and there's some description of them and you're jointly modeling perception and language to make a consistent world model where you say something like all these blocks are yellow. Uh, you're pointing to these blocks here and you learn that yellow corresponds to this world classification, this classifier that describes things in the world from the examples that you're given. So to give that a slightly more formal task description, you're given some visual input, and here it's labeled as ground truth, this really should be perceptual truth, some language, and your goal is to generate a new classifier, create a formal expression that says something like, I don't actually, you know, that maybe it's a new color, maybe it's a new color classifier associate a, an actual trained classifier with it that of all objects says either true or false. This is called, this is yellow, this isn't yellow. And the truth that you're training over is these are the things somebody is pointing at and these are the things that they're not pointing at. Given a few examples of that, you want to be able to say, okay, if somebody says these are the ones that are blue, you want a formal language, you want a formal parse of that that describes things in the world. And I'm using here, by the way, I'm using color blue for our convenience in reading. It's actually going to be something like lambda x dot color classifier, new classifier 4701. And visual inputs that use those classifiers to subdivide the world into categories. The learned classifier has denoted things that look like this in the past. And once you have learned those models, both trained the classifier with your positives and negatives and learned what natural language corresponds to what formal language, then you can treat a new phrase as a grounded query, a query against the things that you can see in the world. Um, and hopefully, uh, blue, you know that the word blue that you've encountered is associated with this classifier, and that is these things. Um, uh, and, you know, you know that that word was used to invoke that particular classifier, so these are the things we want. And what's going on here 
is that you, wait, it, under the covers is that you're asking what is the probability of a particular grounding or any grounding and joint width um, this classifier and this set of visual percepts based on a parsing model. What is the probability that this is the formal language that we're using uh, given this natural language? What is the probability that this is the true world state given what we're observing? And what is the probability that this is the correct grounding given that learned formal interpretation and world state interpretation? And the answer, of course, or I wouldn't show the slide, is that this works really well, um, treating it as a formal project, as a formal problem in this setting. And it works really well for actions, not just objects. Basically, anything that you can talk about a classifier and a robotic world interpretation, world state. Another, and this is where sort of the idea of, of grounding as classification and grounding as alignment meet is in practice, grounded language learning, any learning, any machine learning uh, really benefits from, I would go so far as to say needs negative examples, which we can provide when we know what words mean, but it's difficult to provide when we don't. And the reason for that is if you ask people to describe things that they're going to want your robot to interact with, they see, say things like, this is a lemon, this object is a yellow ball. They never say things like, this is not a carrot. Um, in natural language, it's very hard to get negatives without explicitly prompting for them, which is not the kind of natural interaction that we're after. And because language is not exhaustive as used, the lack of a positive example or a positive label does not imply that it's a negative label. A thing that is described as a lemon cannot be assumed to be an example of something that isn't yellow. Okay. So in order to, in theory, if the alignment idea, if the shared joint embedding idea is correct, you should be able to leverage that shared manifold, the unobserved space in which these things correspond to find negative samples, among other things, even if you don't know the correspondences yet, even if you haven't learned that manifold or those models yet. Um, and the way that we demonstrate this is take all of the descriptions of objects. And at this stage, we do not have objects. We're not considering them at all. There's a set of objects that were described by language, but we're not looking at them. We're only taking the descriptions and we're encoding each description as a vector in semantic space, in some semantic space, right? And the hope is that if our encoding, if our linguistic encoding is correct, that similar descriptions will give similar vectors. So even though we don't have groundings yet, we can compare two vectors and say, these are describing things that are similar because they're close together. These are describing things that are dissimilar because they are far apart. And in practice, if you try that on an object or object data set, um, this is, you know, hundreds of objects. So again, this is a selected sample, but given a yellow banana and a, a request to learn what does yellow banana mean, and here's an object associated with it. You can go and look at only one modality, only the language, or in this case, or only the vision, to ask what things are similar to it in the data that we've observed. And these, you can say these are dissimilar things. These things down here are very dissimilar because they were described dissimilarly. So these are good negative examples for learning from. And doing so uh, gives you what are sort of satisfying human level positive and negative examples, which is the which of these things is closest to this idea. Uh, what things should I be learning if I'm trying to learn what the word carrot means or the word red means? Um, and here are the things that are directly referred to by that. And on the right hand side are things that we've determined are, are good negative examples for learning what red isn't, what a carrot isn't. And 
again, for me, uh, that works if it works when a robot is asked is tasked to do things. So some common approaches to this in grounded language, since of course it's a standing problem, are either use all non-overlapping examples as negative examples. And the intuition there is just that most things aren't lemons. So that should work reasonably well or randomly choose some number of samples that aren't positively referred to and treat those as negatives. But in fact, trying to use some semantic interpretation or rather some semantic embedding of the language to understand what things are similar and dissimilar gives you far better performance. And it gives you better performance because the shared joint connection does exist. You know, these things do refer to similar things in conceptualizing what it means to be a lemon or walking forward. So I'll pause and ask if that answered your question, Stephen, and raised questions in general before I move on. Are there other questions from, from anybody else? I don't want to be the, the one that's asking all the questions. If not, I'm going to ask, ask a question. I have a quick question, if that's OK. Go ahead. Um, sorry. Hi. So my question is, is there any limitation to the objects or things that we include in this category, which means are we limited to physical objects? Are we limited to a specific size or specific color or lettering? You know what I mean? Like, what are the limitations that we can have basically using that method? If that makes sense. That's, that's an extremely good question, um, because, of course, there are limitations. And one of the limitations is using this method. Um, there must be some perceptual meaning for the objects. Um, there's no mechanism by which robots can interact with or perceive things that are more conceptually abstract, broader, like, you know, dreams, for example. So if there's no perceptual grounding, then this isn't the kind of grounding that I'm doing. Got it. Yeah. In terms of what the objects themselves or the actions themselves can be, all of the examples that I'm showing um, are relatively simple concepts, like you know, lemons are a, a clear physical category, red is a clear physical, physical category. There's later work that I'm not actually going to go over in this talk, but you know, obviously could, in which we do uh, category free learning, where rather than having a set of classifiers and a set of concepts of understanding that correspond to colors or shapes or whatever, we do in fact deep learning over a large data set of things to get, and then rather than using the, the learned model for anything, take the penultimate layer of it, the logits, and treat those as feature inputs. So the perceptualization, instead of being like, here are the R, G, and B featureizations, are here's this broad set of non-human understandable featureizations that are useful for learning. And doing that, we've successfully learned a much broader set of things than those we had originally intended. So what's nice about that is that when we tested it with people, they'd come in and they'd say things like the ceramic plate. And we were capable of, of dealing with things like that, even though we did not particularly have materials in mind and didn't have any perceptualization specific to something being ceramic or aluminum or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, this is still physically grounded. That makes perfect sense. Thanks so much, that was my question. Any others? Uh, yes, yes, I have a question. It's kind of in the same uh, realm, but it, it it touches on embodiment per se. So physically grounded seems to mean externally grounded, um, but is there a sense in which interpretation relates to the specific affordance and thus um, the, the, the physical grounding would be vectorized by the possibilities as well? Yes and no. Um, there is nothing about what I'm describing that would make that particularly difficult. 
this is a multimodal learning approach that's learning and you know I'm, I'm sort of skimming over this by saying percepts a lot but that's already learning from multiple different perceptual streams some addition of affordances that is given this physical grounding what's physically possible um, or you know what are the the possible actions or visualizations the robot can take which is what i'm taking you to mean is affordances in the robotic sense um that can be another input stream that can be another modal piece that is part of the perceptual trace or rather is another mode in addition to the perceptual trace that's the yes the no is i'm not doing that so i'm saying sure it can handle it um, comfortable in the knowledge that <laughs> i don't have to produce a graph at this moment other questions Steven, I'm just trying to go a little ahead. There'll, there'll be some questions at the end that we can okay. ask. All right. So let's go back to this. So the next thing that I want to talk about, and thank you for that question, by the way, because this brings in the idea of additional modalities, is when computer scientists talk about grounded language, most of the people working in that space are talking about text. And textual language is not that much like speech. Um, speech has a lot of disfluencies and self-contradictions and repair. There's also interlocution difficulties like dealing with anaphora, references back to previous things, the dialogue and timing of having two agents talking to each other. And I think the typical response to that, or at least my typical response to that for a long time, was I'm just waiting for automatic speech recognition to catch up. Um, we're working on text right now because sooner or later, Google or somebody will be giving us text and we'll just work with that. But the problem with that, there are multiple problems with that. One is it's not there yet. Um, automated speech recognition is not the same as automated the kind of text that people type and it won't be it's not perfect if you're in really good shape it's at 90 percent its performance depends heavily on things like what language model you're using the background noise speaker specific characteristics and as is becoming much more of a discussion especially in the machine learning community right now large models favor dominant demographics right so the best automatic speech recognition out there right now doesn't work as well for people who are not native english speakers um anybody with or rather anybody with any kind of accent doesn't work as well for men as it does for women doesn't work as well for people outside a fairly narrow age range too young or too old and it doesn't work there are um, current speech recognition approaches depend on large grounded language models like GPT-3 and similar to GPT-3. And there are a lot of problems with that approach. So my question to myself was, I keep claiming that this is capable of taking in multi multimodal inputs from a variety of, of sensors. And microphones are sensors, right? There's no particular reason that you shouldn't be able to take the raw sound data in and use that to do learning with. So we went and collected a data set, because there wasn't one, of grounded language descriptions of objects that contains the raw the speech that people input. Um, there's about 4,000 spoken descriptions and about 8,000 typed descriptions. We asked a different set of people to type descriptions and Google's automated speech recognition approach or results for transcribing that, which, you know, sub sampling and manually labeling it is about 67% accurate, which is both impressive and insufficient for my purposes. So using that data set, um, we tried taking the spoken language, treating it directly as a percept, combining it with the other more visual percepts, and doing the exact 
same experiments, having the, the same, and then the robot comes in and is asked to pick things up and so on. And I did not expect this to work as well as it worked even on transcribed language on the first run out of the gate, and I was not disappointed. It did not. Um, but the two things that surprised me about it is on our, on our very early attempts, very naive speech featureization. This is the green and red and blue lines are just very standard featureizations for speech used for, mostly for transcription. If we take that featureized speech and learn based on it, uh, we do almost as well as we're doing with transcription. Uh, the difference is less than 10%. But also evaluating our data set uh, and labeling speakers as, you know, having accented speech or being you know, perceptually perceived by our labelers as having female speech or whatever. Uh, the results on the transcribed stuff varied among those groups because the transcription didn't work as well for some of those groups than others. But when you're taking raw speech featureizations and learning language groundings directly from them, there is no difference between those groups. So what that means, first off, is that it's not a featureization. The, the, the fact that groups do not do as well, subgroups do not do as well as other groups in having their language transcribed, or other transcription doesn't work as well for them, means that it's not a product of how the language is featureized. It's a product of the specific training data that's being used. And it also means I can stop thinking about text entirely and pursue just using speech as yet another percept that's driving the grounded language. Um, when I say, okay, robot, pick up the red thing, that doesn't ever need to be readable. Um, it's auditory. I probably won't stop thinking about text, but you know, this is, I think, the direction that robotics in particular must go because people don't want to carry a keyboard around. So I've talked so far about the learning problem, how we can use sort of manifold alignment and speech as a percept, other things as perceptual inputs, and how we can learn from these sort of unlabeled, unsupervised interactions. And the downside of all of this is it's data hungry. Um, this is a very flexible approach or set of approaches and flexible approaches are data hungry. And even if you don't need thousands and thousands of data points, you, you may need some, <laughs> you need maybe at least dozens or, you know, hopefully we can get that down further with approaches like active learning. But when we're doing development, that means that we tend to, we can't bring the robot to a bunch of different spaces. We can't bring the robot to a hospital room and then to a beach and then back to the lab. And we can't bring a broad variety of humans to the robot. Uh, we have the usual human studies problem, which is that our human subjects tend to be drawn from a fairly limited group of participants, which is functionally those that are found on college campuses. And, you know, this problem was exacerbated by suddenly none of us having access to the labs and the robots because um, you might have heard that the United States is having a little problem with its government right now and as a result we've all been locked out of work for almost a year so the data collection problem that we are trying to solve now is how do we get actual real data of people interacting with a wide variety of people interacting with robots in a wide variety of settings. And learning in simulation is a big thing in robotics right now because robots benefit, oh, there's a lot of benefit to from deep learning to robots, but deep learning takes, you know, thousands and millions of data points. And for robots, you have to collect those in real time and sometimes with real people. So the question is, how much can we learn before we put it on the actual robot that we have to keep from breaking? And my conclusion to, or my, my theory, what we are pursuing now is gathering data in lower cost simulated interactions will be accurate enough 
that we can then take it to an actual physical interaction with physical robots. And these sim to real approaches are, are very widespread in robotics right now, as I said, but they are mostly for learning things like grasping and how vision works and how objects fall down. Um, they, are, they have very little overlap with human participation. Where they overlap with human participation, it's mostly humans learning to use the robot, not the robot learning anything about the human. So the goal and what we have built so far is to have this you know, good simulated environment where there's a real person either interacting with a robot um, using a cave that is a virtual setting or preferably low cost commodity virtual reality stuff, you know, a headset that we could take to a local library anywhere and have the robot be perceiving things like vision and speech um, in that simulated setting, learning as much as we can in that setting and then transferring that to real world test cases and finding out how much additional learning we have to do. And the real world test cases won't be identical, of course, because they can't be identical. But my theory is that this should jumpstart the learning pretty successfully. And to, you know, to work on that, we have this half cave at UMBC. It's, this is a curved monitor wall and the person standing in it um, is tracked by a number of sensors. From their perception, they're just standing, as long as they're facing more or less forward, they're just standing in a room doing these interactions. Um, or again, this is, you know, output in a virtual reality setting. And this is our actual cafeteria. This is the main cafeteria on campus. So if you come to visit UMBC after uh, we're allowed to go outside again, then I can take you to this room and, you know, all the objects, it looks rendered, right? It doesn't look exactly real, but all the objects in it move independently and, you know, have temperatures, the robot can move around, surfaces have different textures. And we can simulate, here's what the robot is seeing. Or in a hospital room, here is what a low cost depth sensor might be seeing with the kind of noise that such sensors tend to introduce. And here's what the much higher quality camera may be seeing from the robot's perspective and then perform learning in those contexts. So this is the, this is the actual simulator. Um, if you have a virtual reality headset, get in touch with me. I would love to get you to come and explain objects to a robot. Here it's moving around in a hospital environment and you can see the different kind of percepts changing, the visual percepts changing as it moves around and performs activities. So how am I doing on time? The there's really no technical time limit, but but I, the whole session has to end by uh, noon or twelve fifteen. Oh, if you want okay. to have a pure, if you want to have a pure unadulterated question session, which you you've already done some question answering, then no. you can keep going till the end. Uh, uh, then you can uh, stop before the end. Otherwise, you can keep going as long as you want. There is an, an unanswered question from a little bit earlier, uh, when you were still talking about speech recognition. Uh, do Please. you want to ask that question yourself? Um, You have the capacity through this speech recognition to do some sentiment analysis, tying into social assessments of physical objects or grounded reality and tying that into goals. So would it be possible to implement that? Uh, yes, it's possible to implement both sentence analysis and things like uh, storytelling, which is to say event planning, given the sequence of things that have happened so far. Um, you know, if somebody has asked me to open a cupboard, they're probably going to ask me to take something out of the cupboard next. And that is, that is very much on our radar. I actually have a student who's been doing some sentiment analysis work. It's happening more under the auspices of my natural language collaborators than directly in the robotics and learning space. Well, in the robotics space, we all do learning. Um, so, and it has, it's, it's new because the speech recognition stuff is comparatively new. So 
it is something that we expect to bring in uh, the natural language part of we expects to bring in. Is that a does that answer the question? All right, what I'm, what I'm going to do is skip the final video and go ahead and actually I think I may have nothing left but a slide that says thank you. Do you have any questions? And of course, I haven't done any of this work in a vacuum. I've done it with amazing collaborators and amazing students. So thank you very much for giving me time to talk about this. Uh, I hope that was that was a very high level flyover of a very large body of work. And I'd be delighted to take any questions at all. OK, with that, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, we can applaud, applaud uh, virtually. I would like to ask people who are going to ask questions to turn on, politely turn on your faces as well. It's much more human if we see who's asking the question. Um, Assuming that's feasible for you. If, if you can, yeah. Um, I, I'll, I'll kick off the questions, but anybody can join in with the questions when, whenever you like. I have a basic question about the distinction between inputs. We've now, we've now agreed that there are, there are uh, inputs which are sensory and there are inputs that are linguistic or verbal, um, and objects and features. Objects have features, Objects can be words, in which case there's no question over here, a word is a word and, uh, and word may have features, it may have phonemes or whatever. But if the object is a, is a physical object and there's a sensory input from that physical object, and then there's sensory input from its features, how do you uh, sort of integrate that? Well, so this assuming I'm understanding your question correctly, um, everything, this, this comes back to the idea that robotics is feature, that everything is featureized because it's perceptualized, right? Robots don't see the real world any more than we do. You've got some raw input stream and, sweetie, mommy's giving it off, you have to wait. Sorry. Um, you've got some raw input stream and that has to be featureized in some sense, broken down into some subunits of meaning, even if the features are like every single raw percept in the form of a single frequency or something. So when you say features, do you mean features in that sense or do you mean well, attributes of things? I can use uh, attributes of things. I can, I can uh, use the words that you use because I understand the words no, I know what round and round and blue are, and I know that, for example, a, a plum is round and blue. Plum, the sensory input from a plum is the sensory input from a plum. The sensory input from blue is the sensory input from blue things, including plums. So when you were talking about negative and positive examples, I, was, I, I started to get lost in, in what you were saying, because it seems to me that every time that a, a, a robot learns what's a plum and what's a pear, they're getting negative and positive examples because the, because the features of the, of the um, plum are not the features of the pear and vice versa. Right. And that's how you differentiate the two, right? The plums and pears have some similar features, but some different features. And the features that differentiate them are what make them plums versus pears. So you can't learn on, you will get into trouble if you try to learn on too simplistic a featureization. If you try to learn what a plum is based on nothing but color, for example. Could you explain, could you define what a featureization is? A featureization is taking some set of input data and turning it into more processable units. So for example, if you have some string, I want to go to the store. Uh, to do machine learning over it, you don't put the string into your machine learning system. You extract characteristics of it, like it's a simple noun phrase, and it's got the word store in it, and it's got the word go in it, and those are a verb and an action and so on. 
uh, you extract some set of semantic, syntactic, take a pick, information about it, and then, and which are, are referred to as features. So the fact that the word store occurs is a feature that is either positive or negative for every sentence, right? Um, the fact that there's a noun and a verb in it is positive or negative, positive, the fact that there's a noun in it is positive or negative for any sentence and similarly true for verbs. So that's sort of featureization rather than trying to take something without doing any pre-processing and do learning over it. Um, you do some initial interpretation step. And similarly with vision, um, just, just to, this is a, not what you would actually do, but camera input is very large, right? You've got millions of pixels and each of them has an associated numerical value that's red, green, or blue. So if you're trying to work, learn what colors are, you might featureize that by breaking up it up into tiles, maybe 16 blocks of image, and for each of those blocks, averaging the red values, and then averaging the green values, and then averaging the blue values. And then you've got 16 times three features for that that describe that image. So it's some kind of pre-processing. And it can also be something like, feed, you know, featureize it by feeding it through a classifier that tells you if there's one or two different objects in the image. Um, and then a feature is how many objects are in the image. So it's taking the raw input streams, which for perception and language are too complex to learn from in and of themselves. And De describing some set of characteristics about them that are true or false or have some value from a list of values or are real valued for everything in the data. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see if there are other questions. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm, I'm taking a lot of space. Um, Featureization, I mean, I understand the issue that some people might have with the um, a priori nature of featureization that makes it so that we always get lower and lower and lower. Um, one of, can you, because you're working with robots, is, is functionality something that allows you to define featureization as a sort of optimization function? Not really. <laughs> In a sense, if you throw a bunch of, so this is part of what deep learning is really good for, right? You can throw a bunch of raw data, not featureized data or loosely featureized data into a machine learning system and into a neural network based system and hope to get something meaningful out. And when I was talking about category based learning, um, what I was saying is, or category free learning, what I was saying is that you can take some layer of that neural network when it started learning the weights and values of different things that we don't know what they are because neural networks are opaque and use those directly as features feeding into something. But you cannot both use features as an optimization function that you are trying to optimize and learn something from those features. One of those, it's, it has to be, that's, that would be cyclical. So if you, if you were trying to learn an optimal featureization over a data set and then perform the learning that lets you perform well on that data set, it would have to be iterative. And featureization itself is not, mechanical enough to be iterative. Things like, oh, I should run a part of speech tagger over this sentence um, is not in a mechanical list of now run through all possible features. Thanks. Other questions? Uh, Pia, I can't imagine that you're not going to ask a question. Go ahead. Uh, Turn on your mic, microphone. It's more useful. Sir. 
if anyone wants to come on. Okay. I guess it is on now. Yeah, sorry. A little louder. Make, could you raise your volume? Uh, okay. I hope you understand now. Uh, I guess what uh, what you mean is that you define the. If I understand you well, is that you define at least a basic ontology, a, a set of categories from to start everything. To I don't know. If you can define blue, uh, yellow, red, green, uh, and you have to say at least that these are colors, uh, and that's already some kind of basic. Uh, categorization. Now, how much do you define in your uh, uh, <clears throat> in your basic language? And how easy is it for the ro robot to extend this categorization? Is it possible for the robot to discover new elements of, of these uh, basic categories and expand the ontology? Right. So as it happens, I do not start by defining an ontology. Um, I clearly skipped the wrong project when trying to figure out how to cram everything in. But what we are doing is taking very low level featureizations, like what are the RGB values of pixels and what are the phonemes occurring in a spoken sentence and learning from those and learning just arbitrary alignments from those. Um, initially, we were learning over fixed sets of attributes, color, shape, object type. Um, although we don't do that anymore, I would still push back on the notion that we're defining an ontology there because ontologies imply a level of interrelationship and functional and predicate behavior that over describes what we are doing. So this is not really an ontology learning problem. The terms that we're learning, we're not necessarily learning to group into things like materials and colors. So we may learn what blue and yellow and green are, and we may learn what ceramic and aluminum are, and we may learn what round is. But we are not learning that those things are all members of color or material or, you know, we may learn to understand the word laptop, but we're not learning that that is a category in and of itself. I would like to do, I, in fact, for an NSF grant asking to do that kind of ontology learning based on the, the learning that we are doing. Um, there has been work in that direction, yes. And it's not trivial. It's not trivial to learn into an ontology if your dead set is be on being as open as possible to whatever humans come up with end up saying. So. Okay, but, but all inputs are by themselves uh, defining some uh, categorization, like RGB is a categorization in itself. And the difference between visual and auditive inputs is a categorization by itself. And that, that I think, okay, personally, I think that's the basis, the, the most basic part of the ontology. And by ontology, I use the word uh, very loosely to define this thing exists. <laughs> Okay, so I should say, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the psych project, um, but uh, Doug Lennett, doesn't matter. Um, I, I use ontology very formally, so that may be part of the differentiation. But although it is true that things exist in categories in the world, I would say that if what we are, if the learning system is not aware of them and is not capable of grouping them or answering questions about them, then the fact that those categories exist is independent of what we are learning, right? So if I've got a whole bunch of features that are not human meaningful, 
which is actually true. And we're learning individual concepts from, so this hurts me because I would like to be learning into an ontology. It's a weakness of the system that we're not, and arguing that we are not hurts my feelings, but we're not. But isn't uh, learning, uh, understanding, exactly uh, building knowledge and the only way to uh, model knowledge is to build an ontology <laughs> okay i'm going to work backwards from the sentence the only way to model knowledge is from building an ontology um no it isn't <laughs> it's, it is building an ontology is a very effective way of modeling certain kinds of knowledge but statistical models still model knowledge, right? Um, they still perform testing as well on testing or better on testing than ontology based systems that are trying to determine understanding. And saying, and, and this kind of comes back to the whole, like, can you really prove that something understands something? Yeah. You cannot, um, but ontology based systems are not the only way to demonstrate performance on understanding tasks as we have them. Um, learning can exist. I, I am fond of saying that if you don't have an ontology somewhere in your AI system, then you do have an ontology, but it's implicit and probably badly thought out. But in, it is not part of the learned model here. Okay, could you um, could you show the slide again uh, where you beat deep learning by a lot and explain how you did it? What what beat what? Sure. Well, deep learning is a. Oh wait, I'm not sharing my screen, am I? Right. So deep learning is not a single thing. And there are things where we use deep learning and other things where we don't. Um, what's going on here, I, I assume this is the slide you mean? Yeah, that's the one. Is um, if your goal is to perform manifold alignment, if your goal is to create an explicit approximation of the implicit sort of shared embedding that I claim these things all refer to in reality. The traditional, or the, I shouldn't say traditional, the current way to do that is by using something called deep CCA learning. Um, and it does not, for the grounded language problem, work very well. So what I'm comparing against in this graph is the, the method that we propose, which is purely geometric as compared to the deep learning method. And- What do you, what do you mean purely geometric? Uh, purely geometric means that it operates in a space of vectorized embeddings and vectorized meanings. You can say these things are physically nearer or physically further apart. We're talking about literally a, a, a geometric manifold that's defined by functions. It's not neural. Okay, but so by but you're using the same metric for doing it with deep learning, CC, and, and your way, and the I mean, difference. The same evaluation. And, and so, if you had to say in a in a sentence what it is that you're doing better, your way, what would it? What is it actually? <sighs> what am I doing better? Well, in order to get. The, the the difference in performance. What I would say is that deep learning is not the right tool for this problem, um, for this particular problem. And the reason I would say that is uh, if you're not doing deep learning right now, you have to say that. Like, I'm a machine learning person, right? For the last eight years, uh, deep learning has been like our, our new toy. It's like we've got this new shiny hammer and machine learning for the last eight years or so has consisted of walking around hitting things with it to see what works. Um, but in this case, 
a simpler, older geometric method when applied to this language grounding task doesn't work as well as state-of-the-art deep learning approaches. Does not. Does not. The red line here is state-of-the-art deep learning approaches. And yeah. perfect performance is the bottom right. Okay. Well, are there, thank you very much.